Hi, most of you know who I am, but just for those who may not, I'm Michael Livengood. And uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, start a project. Several have said to me, Michael, we really have enjoyed hearing you read. Uh, some have said we have loved reading your book. And uh, a thought came to me that uh, it might be interesting to, for me to, to share my book with you in this format. And so for the next, uh, as much of this journey as you can make with me, I want to read from my book, The Glory Factor. I'm going to start today with chapter number one, which is called An Unexpected Encounter. Now, I need to let you know right up front that uh, you can get this book uh, either by going to Amazon.com and under the Glory Factor by Michael Ivengood. You can get an ebook there or you can get the printed copy or you can contact us directly at MikeLivengoodMinistries.com just MikeLivengoodMinistries.com and there'll be a place there on that website where you can order the book and we'll be glad to send it to you. Uh, the book is called The Glory Factor Adventures in Revival. And chapter number one says, uh, kind of the heading at the top, life and not death will be my part, and I will give out the story of the works of the Lord, Psalm 118, verse 17. The chapter is entitled, An Unexpected Encounter. I love a good biographical story, but I've always been somewhat reluctant to share the story, the journey my wife and I have been on. On the one hand, I want to avoid controversy, but on the other hand, I do not want in some subtle way to exalt self. I admit, I, I do like the unknown prophet motif. However, this book on revival will not make the sense it should if I do not share my own story. I hope it will build faith and hunger into the hearts of readers. If God did this for us, I believe he will do it for you. I long to see God do in the lives of others what we experienced in our own. Moses said to his father-in-law in Numbers 10 and 29, Come thou with us, and we will do thee good. We have been on a journey, and I invite you to join us on that journey. If you will, if you'll be open to have him do in your life what he did in ours, it could be a real kingdom-building thing. I was born into the home of an Assemblies of God pastor, while my wife was born in the home of a dedicated lay couple in a neighboring state. Ours is the story of the impact of parents who made a commitment to live for Jesus. Linda and I came to Jesus when we were both about eight years of age. Early in life, Linda felt God called her to be the wife of a preacher. She made a decision to not give her heart to someone who was not living for Jesus. Linda's decision to not become involved with a young man who did not share her calling was a very important one. At the age of 11, I felt God call me to preach. To the age of 12, he filled me with the Spirit. The calling of God to preach did not come through an audible voice. It was the still, small voice of the Spirit at a camp. That call was confirmed by the sense of what I felt standing in the pulpit of the empty church building where my father pastored. That call was also confirmed by the fruit of early days of preaching. I was actively preaching at 17 and involved in church work before that. Linda, too, was very involved in the life of her church in many ways. After graduating from Bible college, Linda and I took our first pastorate at a small church in a small town in western Illinois. We enjoyed three years with a wonderful group of people. I also served as the area youth director for my denomination. Our second pastor was in the eastern border of Illinois. We served this church for almost seven years. Both churches experienced significant growth numerically, financially, 
and spiritually while we were there. In the last four years at that second church, more than 240 people prayed to receive Christ into their life. And in the last year alone, 39 received the baptism in the Holy Spirit during the regular services of the church. Life was good. People got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit almost every week. We never even thought to keep track of those being healed. Healing was normal. In fact, it was more unusual for people not to get healed than healed. During those 10 years, our family was enlarged by the birth of our two sons. However, divine restlessness set in. After wrestling for nearly a year and after receiving wise counsel from the leadership of our denomination, in 1984, we left the security of the pastorate to follow the leading of the Lord into itinerant ministry. From that day to this, there has been a deep sense of satisfaction and awareness. I am doing what God wants me to do. For 12 years, we crisscrossed the heartland of the USA preaching in church revivals and denominational camps. I suppose by most standards of measurement, we were considered a success. While we did not minister in the largest pulpits of our denomination, we did preach with a full schedule. Typically, we were booked one and a half to two years in advance at all times. We experienced what many felt were great results. In 1995 alone, we saw over 800 respond to the Salvation Altar Call. In one preteen camp around 1994-1995, we saw 115 filled with the Holy Spirit in just one service. In 1995, we responded to our first overseas invitation and traveled to Europe to preach, where we were told, what you have seen is a landslide by European standards. We should have been very content. The schedule was full. Our reputation was intact. I received an unsolicited letter from my state's denominational leader in which he said, you are sane, solid, sensible, and spiritual. To that a pastor friend added, and safe. My reputation had become the safe evangelist. When pastors were nervous about scheduling an evangelist, we became the one who was safe. The future was bright. But we're slowly losing the spirit of the fight. My wife was becoming tired of fruitless meetings. She felt there had to be more than we were seeing happen. We would often, she would often stand at our resource table before the Sunday meeting would begin. Behind her on the wall would be a poster placed there by the church advertising the Sunday through Wednesday night services. As people would come and look over the table, some would ask, Are you going to be here tonight? To which Linda would respond, Yes, and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday nights. Oh, would be the response, you are going to be here Wednesday night. It seemed evident that Monday and Tuesday nights went right over their heads. Clearly, they had given no thought to attending the services on those nights. Perhaps they were not particularly observant and had missed the announcements regarding the meetings. Perhaps a church had failed to promote coming revival services. Whatever the case, it was beginning to have an effect upon Linda. She was asking herself uh, why we were living in a tin can travel trailer and doing these services night after night if nobody cared. She wanted me to give her permission to make phone calls to pastors where we were scheduled to preach. She wanted to find out if they were serious about the meetings or if we just represented the annual revival services they felt compelled to have. She wanted to eliminate those who were not serious about a move of God. She was so intense about it, 
that I was afraid to let her touch the phone for fear she would end up canceling most, if not all, of our meetings. My youngest son, who was still traveling with us at the time, was speaking about going off the road. He thought maybe we should take a church where he could go to a local high school and impact that school for Jesus. He was ready to go win the school to Christ, and he probably would have succeeded. I was now being required to remind him it was time to get cleaned up and ready for each evening's service. He was not rebellious. He simply had picked up the spirit of apathy in many churches. He would say later he had become very critical of the way churches were doing church. He was sure there was a better way. And as much as I would not admit to it, I was becoming stale spiritually. We do not misunderstand. We loved Jesus. We were faithful in his work. Our devotional lives were intact. And there was no sin in our lives that we were aware of. But we were saying there must be more than this. When I compare what I saw in my ministry with what I saw in God's word, something was missing. When I compared what I saw in my ministry with church history, something was missing. People would often say, we always look forward to you coming to do meetings because there is always such an anointing of the Spirit when you come. To be honest though, I felt very little, if any, anointing. I became pretty good at spinning a story Every few months, we would have a really good meeting, and we would live on the residue of that until the next good meeting came along. Our hearts were crying out, there must be something more. We were on a constant search to do what we were doing more effectively. Pastors often said we were among the most cutting edge of the evangelist. We were told uh, you adapt to church life better than any other evangelist we know. It is never the same old, same old with you. Yet, I found myself wondering if it was time to make a change. I was afraid if things continued as they were that Linda was on the edge of burnout. I really did not fear we were to pastor a church again, but I knew things could not continue as they were. During this season, God began to surprise us. I would suggest there were many significant moments in our lives that we do not realize have history written on them. Even reading this book may be a very significant moment for some. I pray God will make this a God moment that will change your future. Three really huge things occurred for us although at the time, I probably did not realize how huge they were. The first occurred in a church in South Georgia in February 1995. The pastor had called for early morning prayer during the special meetings. It was popular in that season to have these early morning prayer meetings. It seemed the belief system was that the earlier you can make them, uh, the more spiritual they were. On this particular morning, the prayer meeting was well attended. Uh, that is, if you consider the pastor and myself as the only attenders, being a well attended prayer meeting. I was about 15 minutes into prayer. I reached the time of temple cleansing, where I allow the Holy Spirit to search out and clean up this temple called Michael Life and Good. As my custom was, and still is, I was praying through Psalm 51, 10, and 11. I break it down into four passages, four phrases as I pray. Create in me a clean heart, opens the passage. So I prayed for a clean heart. I invited the Holy Spirit to bring to my attention anything within my heart or life that was not pleasing to Him anything I needed to have him wash with the blood of Jesus. Then I moved on to 
Renew a right spirit within me. I prayed for a right spirit, a right attitude. I prayed for a right spirit toward his word and toward his work. Then I prayed for a right spirit toward his workers and toward his world. The next phrase was, cast me not away from thy presence. Typically, this was the shortest part of the temple cleansing for me. I would hasten to get to the part about take not thy Holy Spirit from me, where I would focus on praying for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be on my life and in the meeting that night. But on this Monday morning, it was like I got caught up with the phrase, cast me not away from thy presence. I could not move on. I spent most of my prayer time right there. That night, I preached on the presence of the Lord. Then I preached the following night on the presence of the Lord. In fact, I preached on the presence of the Lord over and over during that year. I could not escape the subject. I preached great messages on a subject that as a second generation Pentecostal preacher who had worked youth camps for over 15 years, I was sure I understood. Looking in the rearview mirror, I recognize now that I knew very little about it. The sermons were biblically sound, but relatively shallow experientially. For most of 1995, I continued to preach, pray, and probably grew a bit more frustrated. The second major event came at the close of that year. We received our first invitation for ministry outside the USA. We were invited by missionaries Michael and Merle McNamee to travel to Europe to minister. I had zero interest in ministry beyond our borders. But to the shock of both uh, my wife and, uh, and myself, I accepted the invitation. In fact, when Michael first invited us to come as we sat eating a pizza in Carlinville, Illinois, I thought he was joking. When I said yes, my wife nearly passed out. We raised the necessary funds and went to Europe <coughs> where Michael had arranged for ministry in Belgium and Denmark. We had a great time. In every service but one, people were saved and or filled with the Holy Spirit. As I said before, we were told, by European standards, you have seen a gully washer. It was during that trip God put something into the heart of our youngest son about learning to play the guitar so he could become a worship leader. However, the real significance of the trip was not the ministry we were doing. God waited until the last day to spring his plan. Because our missionary host had hurt his back, he was not able to accompany us to Denmark. His wife correctly observed this is a God thing. The Lord wants Michael and Linda to understand what it means to come into a country where you do not speak the language and you do not understand the culture. He wants them to get a genuine understanding of what it means to be a missionary. Because of his injury, Michael could not travel to Denmark and some churches were reluctant to have us speak without him. So the last Sunday found us simply attending an international church. Our son had gone off with a newfound friend to attend a large Danish church. But Linda and I felt like we wanted to attend this international church that met in the basement of a hotel in Copenhagen. I remember how cold the basement was, especially the floor. The preacher was a guest speaker, to be honest, I do not remember a thing that he said. And if he were to walk into this room right now, I would not recognize him. I only remember he was an Asian by ethnicity and had just returned from some revival in Canada. At the close of the revival service, we joined most of the church in receiving prayer. The preacher had a prophetic word for me 
along the lines of doors that God would open that no man could shut and doors God would shut that no man could open. Even though I remember well those words, I also recall there was no special sense of God at work. An afternoon service was announced and Linda and I made the decision to attend that meeting as well. We probably attended it just to kill time while we were waiting for our driver to come from Belgium to pick us up. At the close of that service, we received prayer again. Quite unexpectedly, I found myself on the cold floor of that basement. I was not unfamiliar with the manifestation of being slain in the spirit or falling out in the power. I grew up Pentecostal. From time to time, this would happen in the churches I grew up in. Indeed, on two different occasions, I had gone through seasons where nearly every person I prayed for had this type of experience. But it was not something that happened often to me. Typically, if ten people were in a prayer line and nine fell to the floor, I would be number ten, the one still standing. As I laid there on the floor, <clears throat> I was aware of the following. First, it was very cold on that floor. Second, I was not aware of any special encounter with God. I did not feel His presence and I did not hear His voice. Third, I was unable to get to my feet. <clears throat> it was like I was glued to the floor. Fourth, I was aware the preacher was waving his arm over my prostrate body and saying, More, Lord. Even though my eyes were closed, I could tell when his arm created a shadow over me when it moved between the light and myself. And I did not understand the prayer, More, Lord. More of what? was my question. We returned to the States where for the next three months, I received more, more hunger <clears throat> and more frustration. Often it seems the Lord has to work in a way that appears to be contrary to what we are asking for. The third huge event took place in March 1996, about 13 months after beginning this intense prayer focus on the presence of the Lord. We were ministering in northern Mississippi. The meeting for the next week was canceled on us, and we had no place to go. The week after that, we were to speak on the Gulf Coast. We thought about attending a Signs and Wonders conference being sponsored by the Assemblies of God in Springfield, Missouri, but we did not have the funds to travel there. In fact, we really did not even have the funds to return to our home in Illinois. I tried unsuccessfully to find a place to preach in Mississippi. Normally, I could always find a replacement service, but not this time. The pastor of the church in Mississippi said something to me about a revival that was in its eighth month in Pensacola, Florida. I had heard about it around six months before. A hurricane had gone through Pensacola in that time frame, and I had called a pastor where we had preached a short time earlier to see how they were doing. And he told me about a revival at Brownsville Assembly of God that they had been attending. I had really given it no more thought. So when the Mississippi pastor suggested I check that revival out, I was surprised to find it was still going on. The pastor said to me, Michael, your head is screwed on straight. Why don't you go to that revival and let me know what you think? Is it a real move of God or not? In hindsight, I find it interesting how often we preachers believe God needs us to determine if what He is doing is the real thing. Since we are scheduled to be just two hours from Pensacola the following week anyway, we decided to visit the revival and send an analysis back to the pastor. I began to get a sense of something going on 
when I checked into the campground and asked about the location of the Brownsville Assembly of God on DeSoto Street. They asked me if that was the church in revival and gave me its location. As one who has been sent on many wild goose chases searching for church locations, I was impressed this location was well known over 30 minutes away. As we drove to the Sunday morning service and we had no idea what the revival schedule was, I made the following statement to my wife and son. If this is God, then there are three things I need. I need a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. I need fresh direction. And I need fresh inspiration. I was so aware that we could not continue as we were. Something had to change. My wife remembers thinking, aren't you being philosophical this morning? I think our first clue that this was going to be different was when we pulled up to the church and read the huge signboard that announced 14,000 had been saved in the last eight months. That got my attention, especially when the Holy Spirit whispered a question to my heart. And how many got saved in your last meeting? We found a seat inside the auditorium. There was a definite buzz in the atmosphere. I attributed it to the buzz of a large event. As a pastor, we had hosted a two-day citywide crusade with David Wilkerson many years before. I had attended other similar events and at first thought, this is that. Yet somehow, it seemed different. Deeper, perhaps. I took my pad and pen out to take notes so I could pass along my observations to the pastor. The worship was strong. The people really were entering in. I well remember four events that occurred during the worship. We were sitting on the front row of a section of seats about halfway back in the auditorium. The gentleman to my right in the next section over suddenly fell to the floor under the power of the Spirit. A lady from the section in front of us had slipped into the open space in front of my family where she knelt to worship the Lord. In a few moments, she too was overcome and fell over on the floor. As I watched these two, I knew it could be God or it could be flesh. I had seen those in the church I had served who were fall downers. During their prayer time, if others were falling to the floor and if the catchers were in place, they too would fall down. The Lord may not have been in it, but they would fall anyway. So I watched these two as they quietly wept before the Lord. Secondly, I watched a row of young people, about two rows in front of us, who were shaking under the power. Shaking is a mild word. They appeared to be jerky in rather strange ways during the worship. I had seen people tremble when they felt the power of God. Uh, my grandmother attended a particular Pentecostal church and whenever she felt the power of God, she would give a little shriek, uh, for lack of a better word, and her hand would shake. I trusted Grandma, but I always assumed it was a learned cultural behavior practiced in her church. In fact, uh, I called it the Church of God Shakes. Now, let me quickly apologize to any readers of that group. As I watched the, younger, the young people, I said to myself, okay, I've seen that. Well, not that exactly, but pretty close. That could be God or that could be flesh. Although I was not sure who would really want to shake that violently. The third thing that grabbed my attention was the group of people toward the front who were dancing before the Lord. I had served as an advisor for the women's glow group in our community and I thought I recognized the Jerusalem two-step. Once again, I thought that could be God or it could be flesh. 
I had vivid memories of watching my Pentecostal pastor father dance in the spirit at an altar. I would watch in amazement as he would dance with eyes closed, a look of bliss on his face, and weave his way through a crowded altar and never touch a person. There was never a doubt that what he was doing was in the spirit. However, I did not know about this bunch. Then my attention was captured by a little girl, perhaps 10 years of age, on the other side of the auditorium. I watched her dance with her eyes closed for nearly 45 minutes in a space no more than a couple of meters or yards in any direction. She was not calling attention to herself. There was a purity about her devotion to the Lord. As one who had spoken in many camps for children her age, I knew this was not flesh. Children do not worship for 45 minutes with their eyes closed. I think I'm going to pause right there in the reading and just uh, mention again, we've been reading now for almost 30 minutes and uh, let me take a moment again to say this book, The Glory Factor, published by Evergreen Press, uh, and Michael Livingood, myself, is the author, is available at our website, MikeLivingoodMinistries.com, uh, or you can pick it up at Amazon, uh, and you can pick up there uh, the book either through ebook or the printed copy. Uh, we will be continuing to read this, uh, continuing on with this chapter, and I want to invite you to join me as I continue to read The Glory Factor.